Good afternoon. Really a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to ask you to repeat a couple of things, and then I'm going to get started. All right? So repeat after me. Right data. Right data. Rich picture. Rich picture. Best solutions. Best solutions. Okay, that's going to be the framework for my brief comments today. It's the right data that helps you get a rich picture that empowers you to give the best solutions. So it would be really, really easy as an instructional coach for me to come into a classroom where instruction isn't going well and just to say, listen, this lesson isn't going well. I have been tempted on several occasions to say just those things. Uh, but after doing that and not getting success, I said, I really have to frame this around student work. And so I'm going to give you an example of how I've used student data recently to really drive a conversation toward better solutions. I went to 11th grade English class just about a month ago. And uh, the teacher was frustrated because she had so many things that teachers have to do. And teachers have to do the most things of anybody that I've ever seen, really. And so she was talking to me, and I was listening to her, and I was really trying to be a good listener and trying to be empathetic. My wife would be very proud. And so I was listening, <laughs> and I was being empathic. And uh, I, I let her really get out of frustrations, uh, most of which were extremely valid. In the back of my head, though, I knew that if your instruction wasn't great, no excuses would be enough for students, no excuses would be enough for parents, and no excuses would be enough for our society. So you really had to get to some good instruction. So I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into your classroom. I'm going to observe without judgment and just do a transcript of the whole 90 minutes. And so that's what I did. And at the end, I started with the student products. What we found is that only one student had attempted the actual exit ticket for the lesson. Then I said, let's, let's pull back and look at some more student products. So we started the conversation around data, right? And then I started the conversation to expand it, because what a student produces isn't the only data that makes a difference. What about number of hands raised? What about smiles? What about eye contact? And so we talked about all of those qualitative measures, in addition to the fact that no one really completed an exit ticket for the whole 90 minutes. And we started to pull back that conversation. So we had the right data. Once we pulled back a little further, I walked with her and helped her to see what the right picture was. She was under the belief that the lesson went OK. But after we went through the data, she was able to see this really wasn't successful. Then at the end of it, I actually had a teller, someone who has more experience in education than I do and is infinitely more intelligent, that you understand, based on our conversation, that no learning occurred in 90 minutes in your class. Now, that didn't go over great. <laughs> But it went over much better than if I didn't have the data and the conversation to make the point. And in fact, I wasn't making the point. We were making it together. So after we got to that conclusion, she followed that up with, with this four-letter word. She said, I need help. I don't know how to do some of the things that you're talking about. And I said, that's where we can begin. We don't get there if we don't deal with the right data and we don't have the right picture so that we can get to those best solutions. And so now I'm working with her and her co-teacher around how do we scaffold for learning? How do we get students to the exit ticket? If things are getting out of whack and behavior is the issue, then how do we make sure that we rope that in and actually have an effective solution? But we can't start that without the right data. I also brought up an interesting point, because a lot of times when teachers in Paul Lawrence Dunbar is a great historic school, it is the first public school for African Americans in the district, and just got remodeled as a beautiful and a great principal there. But it's a challenging school. And so with the challenging school comes very challenging behaviors. And I readily admit that. But I also wanted to bring some truth to it. She talked about the students' behaviors. And she talked about all the different distractions that she had to endure. And I said, you understand that if you implemented the lesson as executed with no behavior problems, you would have still had the same result. Again, they did not go over well. <laughs> but if we have the right data, we can then get to the right picture so we can have the best solutions. And so what I appreciate about the data quality campaign is that this emphasis on the right data so that you can do is what I've been doing for my whole career in education. Uh, and it's really something that took on new meaning for me when I became a department chair. Uh, several years ago in another school district, I became a department chair of English and Reading. 
And so I was like, okay, um, I have some great ideas. We have some great teachers. It's going to be a fantastic year. So at the end of the year, right around June, we got our results back from, at that time, the MSA. And for the first time in our school's history, we had gone back by about 10 points across all grades. I was devastated. And I'm an English person, so I was like, what do I do with all this math, right? But the good thing is, as I started to peel back the layers of the data, I started looking at not just what was happening in the classrooms, but what was happening in the environment of education in the school, I started to get the right picture. And then I sat down with a lot of the people of the department, and we started crafting better solutions. By the time the next year came around, we had regained all our losses back and even advanced some. And so this, this idea of using the right data to paint the right picture to get the best solutions is something that is absolutely vital in education. It's something that I cannot look into a parent's face really honestly and say that I've done a great job if I haven't done that work. So right after I finish this, these comments, I'm going to go right back to Paul Lawrence Dunbar and observe another teacher, actually the same teacher I just talked to you about, so this will be interesting. Um, <laughs> but before that, I want to tell you a story that I, I just saw before I got here. So I was in another classroom, uh, and it was well-intentioned first-year educators. And my first year, I don't even want to talk about it because I will exhibit the symptoms of a trauma victim. So I don't want to, <laughs> I really don't want to bring it up. Uh, but a first-year teacher, and, he, and they're both great, uh, and it was in a math class, but it was very formulaic, right? And if we're looking at common core practice, we're looking for something that's deep and conceptual in math. And so I was trying, I was struggling to, to get the words out to the assistant principal because he said, how did it go? I said, well, I don't really know. And all I could think about was my five-year-old son. My five-year-old son's name is Josh, like myself. He's a great, wonderful, energetic ball of energy, as all boys are. He's all over the map. By the way, that idea that girls talk more than boys is not true, by the way. He talks all day. Anyway, sidebar. So um, he loves to do the things that dad likes to do. He loves sports like I do. And he loves playing video games like I used to do. So he said, oh, Dad, I want to play on your Xbox. I said, OK, fine. He said, I want to play NBA 2K. I said, fine, that's a pretty complex game for a five-year-old, but we can try it. He's like, all right, I'll do it. And so over the course of maybe three weeks, I've been teaching him how to play this game as much as I can because they're very complicated. So now he knows to pick LeBron James and to press on the button and to get a dunk. That's what he knows, right? <laughs> now, what does he say to me and uh, my wife or his mom? What does he say? He says, I know how to play NBA 2K. Now, does he really know how to play it? Maybe. So this is what I think we get trapped into. In classrooms, if we're going by a very rote process, if they just do the things that we said in situations that are similar, we think they know it. But in fact, they only know what you just told them to do step by step, but not the deep nuances of the game. When I play my son, and I only try to beat him by a little bit, but when I play him, I'm thinking about a lot more than just pushing and scoring because I have a deep conceptual knowledge of the game. And so this data quality campaign and the priorities there helps us to peel back and say, what is the right data so we can truly see our students and get the right pictures for the best solutions? There's nothing worse than telling a student that they understand something when they actually truly don't. And what's worse than that is that you don't even know the difference. A lot of times, and I'll end with this, oftentimes in campaigns, which we're in a really crazy one right now, um, in national campaigns, uh, both parties, this is what they have an agreement on, is they'll say that education is the civil right of our time. It's a very big priority. If education is the civil rights of our time, then knowing what the right data is for the right picture is the heart of that work. If we don't know that, we can't truly say that we're actually giving the best solutions. And we owe it to ourselves, our students, and our future. Thank you.